One of the more important lessons my rich dad taught me, he said there was four types of people in the world of business or money, whatever he said. And this here are the four different types of people, and he called this the cash flow quadrant. So E stands for employee, S stands for self-employed, small business or specialist, like a doctor or a lawyer. B stands for big business, 500 employees or more. And I stands for investor. Now, the distinction here is this, is that each of these are four different types of people. They have four different tax laws for all four different types of people, and this is throughout the world. But it was my poor dad who always said to me, you know, son, go to school so you can get a job. So my poor dad wanted me to be an employee like him. And there's nothing wrong with that and all this, except the tax laws are the worst for employees. As Warren Buffett says, you know, he, as a business owner and investor, he pays a lower percentage rate than the employees. And many employees are having a tough time today. Not only is there high gas prices, but there's going to be higher taxes. My mother wanted me to become a doctor or a specialist or a small business person. And I said to my mom, S stands for smart. She says, you got a good point there because I didn't do well in school. So I wasn't going to make it there. It was my rich dad who advised me to become an entrepreneur or a big business owner like Bill Gates or Steve Jobs, Michael Dell, or those guys who created Facebook and Yahoo and all this, or Google. And he wanted me to become an investor. So he started me playing the game of Monopoly, you know, four greenhouses, one red hotel. So I learned to be an investor and I learned to be an entrepreneur. So the good news is, if you want to get rich, you can get rich in all four quadrants, okay? That's up to you. And so it was my rich dad who said to me, he says, you know, Robert, if you really want to be rich, learn to build businesses. It made more sense to him to work hard to build a business, something you owned and something you could pass on for generation to generation to your kids. Whereas my poor dad said, work hard. But my rich dad said, why would you work hard for something you'll never own and you can get fired from right away? Again, that was the difference in values. So my rich dad suggested I learn how to be a business owner and learn how to be an investor. And that's one of the big differences. On this side of the quadrant, these people here work for security. They work for money also. On this side over here, their key value that they want is they want freedom. They don't want to have to work at a job anymore. They don't want to have to work for the rest of their lives. So the beauty of building a business and learning how to invest is very simply that this is passive income. You work hard for a few years, but possibly for the rest of your life, income keeps flowing to you. Again, the reason somebody thinks a house is an asset is because they lack financial intelligence or low financial IQ. They may go on to Harvard or in whatever, but if you can't tell an asset from a hole in the ground, I don't know what the heck you can tell the difference of, you know? <laughs> so, it's really quite simply, the most important word, for those of you in business or finance know, the most important word, it's not income, expense, asset, liability, the most important word in the English language for the rich is a word called cash flow. You've gotta know where the cash is flowing. So what a rich person is doing is, con is controlling cash flow. So, if money comes from an asset into your pocket, it's an asset. So very simply, my nine years old, my rich dad said, assets put money in your pocket whether you work or not. Okay, repeat after me. Assets put money in your pocket whether you work or not. Okay? And very simply, <clears throat> liabilities take money from your pocket. Okay? So what does a liability do? It takes money from your pocket. Okay. So the way you know you have an asset or a liability is very simply this, of let's say you're married with three kids and all this stuff, and you stop working. The money coming in is money from an asset, and the money going out is money from a liability. So if you happen to have a little house sitting over here, and it's sucking cash out of your pocket every month, it's a liability and can do it. A number of years ago, I bought a $7 million uh, commercial building. I paid for it with zero down. And every month after everything is paid for, it puts about $30,000 a month income in my pocket or $360,000 a year for no money down. So that is the price of having a good education or a bad education. 
a good education is knowing that good debt versus bad debt and how debtors can win if you know what you're doing. Even in this economic environment of high volatility, because I'm basing all of my investments not on capital gains or appreciation, I base all of my investments on cash flow, how much money comes in. So even though the real estate market has crashed, I hate to say this, but in a good, it's been good for me because more people became renters all of a sudden. So my rental rates went up, my income went up, I'm paying for it with cheap dollars and things like this. So in the new rules of money, you have to know the difference between good debt and bad debt and why savers are losers and debtors are winners. If you take a look at this 40-year run on the dollar, the dollar is designed economically to lose money every single year. So why would you save something that loses money every year? And what this means for somebody on retirement plans is that after you retire, your, your, the value of your dollar goes down and your cost of living keeps going up. To my rich dad, that was bad advice and made no sense. So the third new rule of money is, I think the big mistake is, I hear so many people say it's important to save. That's ridiculous. And the reason that's ridiculous is because what happened in 1971 is crucial. In 1971, the U.S. dollar stopped being money. In 1971, the U.S. dollar became a currency. And what that meant is Richard Nixon, in 1971, the president, took us off the gold standard. That's like giving an alcoholic free rein to the bar. Or it's like giving somebody who can't control their spending unlimited credit cards. So what's happening is all the savers today are losers. You know, the problem with 1971 is that the federal government keeps printing money, so the value of your money keeps going down. So these people, I'm saving, saving, saving. And if you notice, as the value of the dollar goes down, prices go up. So they call this inflation. You know, you look at in, in um, 1997, oil was about, I think, $10 a barrel. Ten years later, it's about 135 a barrel. So they say it's inflation, but really what it is is the dollar's value coming down. So savers are getting wiped out today. So as Federal Reserve Bank, which I believe was created in 1913. In 1971, the reason 1971 is such an important time was because the U.S. Federal Reserve became the bank to the world. They could print as much money as they wanted. Never in the history of the world has anybody been allowed to print money for the rest of the world. Let me backtrack one more time. I talked about how the Romans did it, the Greeks did it, and all this. Every time people have done this, chaos has broken out, and that's why there's chaos in the world today. So in 1913, when the U.S. Federal Reserve Bank was created, they were basically allowed to print money for the world. Every time that has happened throughout history, a despot has arrived. For One of the problems of this is you have to understand that, first of all, the U.S. Federal Reserve Bank is not U.S. It is made up of a bunch of international rich guys from all, all over the world. The second thing, it is not federal. It's not a U.S. entity. It is, kind of, again, a bunch of rich banks from all over the world. Third, it has no reserves. There is nothing there. And fourth, it's not a bank. So that's why when I talk to people about really needing to understand the new rules of money, which really began to take effect in 1971 when we were allowed to print money for the rest of the world, is understanding that this system here is causing the rich to get richer and the poor and middle class to get poorer, but most importantly, the lower middle class is almost getting wiped out. High prices, volatilities in the market, food getting more expensive, gas getting more expensive, savings getting wiped out, home values going around. And the reason the troubles have started again is the U.S. Federal Reserve Bank is not U.S., it's not federal, there's no reserve, it's not a bank.